Coming up on this week's show, Toyota takes on the Honda BRV with the eagerly anticipated rush. What it does give you is an SUV that now really does have legitimate space. 607 liters in fact. And yes, you can fold the seats forward and when you do, oh, it's pretty much cavernous. We round up the new models that have debuted locally and abroad, including VW's Touareg. One of the most noticeable features, however, is the so-called InnoVision cockpit, which sports an integrated central infotainment screen and digital instrument cluster, similar to the layout found in some Mercedes-Benz models. And we take an in-depth look at the BMW M5's enviable heritage. The shark-nosed four-door was released in 1985, employing a derivative of the six-cylinder engine that featured in the M1 Coupe. You're watching Ignition GT. Hello and welcome to this week's show. The Honda BRV left us pleasantly surprised when we drove it back in 2016. Now, using the uninspiring Mobilio as a base, the Japanese company added some vital desirability by upping the specification level and then also attaching some rugged looking body cladding. Now, Toyota has followed a very similar recipe to create the Rush. Is it going to be as impressive as its rival? Let's find out. This badge, South Africans love. And to be honest, I haven't always understood why. When you take their models and stack it up against competitors, you know, they very seldom end up on top, but where they do end up on the top is when it comes to sales. It's because they're reliable and dependable, you'll say. I guess you wouldn't blindly believe that unless there was some merit in the notion. Or is it perhaps that their cars, although many of them for me are bland and uninspiring, are exactly the cars that you as consumers want to drive. And let me tell you what South Africans want to drive right now is an SUV. And I think Toyota is on the money with their new rush. It looks really good, eh? especially like this, dead on from the front. That prominent grille, those LED lights that are upswept, I like the two ridges on the bonnet as well, very nice. And even the detailing around the front fogs give it a real purposeful look, very nice. It's amazing what a big difference a good set of wheels can do. It really gives a car personality and I like the two-tone 17-inch alloys on the Rush. It has class leading ground clearance of 220 mils. And with all that cladding in the right places, the crossover from MPV to a legitimate SUV, I think, is complete. What is also interesting, even though the Rush is only rear-wheel drive, it's got a weight depth of 600 millimeters. And with its rough road compliance, trust me, this car is going to go to places that the competitors wouldn't even consider. I like these two strong lines that run the length of the car, in particular the shoulder line that runs into the LED taillight cluster. Without them, it would be a pretty bland sideshow. The color-coded boot spoiler finishes things off nicely. But all the action is in the rear because Toyota South Africa has decided not to bring the Rush out with a third row of seats. The cup holders, of course, are the giveaway. I think it's a good move though because the Rush and the Avanza then clearly don't compete. And what it does give you is an SUV that now really does have legitimate space. 607 liters in fact. And yes, you can fold the seats forward and when you do, oh, it's pretty much cavernous. But this does pose a bit of a problem for Toyota, and it is one that they are working on, is how do they provide a cover for the boot area, something that you have to have in South Africa. Space in the rear is also really good. Take a look, plenty of legroom and headroom. And what is nice for your comfort, the seats do recline, and there's also climate control. They've also added electric windows, and there are twin cup holders in the doors, as well as a 12 volt power supply. But what I'm most happy about is the safety. The Rush has six airbags. That is four more than any of their competitors. And with them choosing to scrap the seats in the rear, it now means everyone is covered. That's brilliant. And it has vehicle stability control, a non-negotiable for me. Guaranteed, the first thing that you're gonna notice when you get behind the wheel of the Rush is this, the seven inch touchscreen, which is beautifully integrated into the dash. It literally has got everything. It's got its own navigation system. It's got an HDMI cable port. It's got USB. It's got Bluetooth connectivity. And very cool, of course, it also works with my iPhone. So I've got Apple CarPlay on it as well. For the modern day consumer, this is probably the biggest selling point for them. 
The steering wheel has some functionality on it, but let me tell you what irritates me the most, is that it's got rack, but it doesn't have a reach adjustment, and that makes it really difficult for me to get into my ultimate comfortable driving position. But in general, you really cannot fault the specification level on the Rush. It also has electric foldable mirrors, it's got climate control, and there's park distance control with the reverse camera. Oh yes, it also has plenty of cup holders up front. I like what they've done with the two-tone on the dash, it looks really good. But then, to go and put it on the doors, I mean think about it, it's going to get so much hand action here, that within a week or two it's going to be grubby. Not a good move. So it's been all positives up till now, here comes its biggest negative. It's no rush to drive. It's tech that has been around for years, the 1.5 litre VVTI petrol engine produces 77 kilowatts and 136 newton meters. It's modest and you have a choice of either a five-speed manual or a four-speed auto. You're going to have to go the five-speed manual especially up at altitude because you literally do need to get every last bit of power out of this engine. I don't think that four-speed auto is going to work at all and because of that it's also quite noisy when you are on the open road. There isn't much refinement around that. It feels like when you are driving at highway speeds that it could probably do with a sixth gear. Its biggest competitor, the Honda BRV, has a six-speed manual linked to its uh, 1.5 litre engine. But then again, that also poses another problem because there's not enough torque. You're probably going to find yourself going through gears unnecessarily. But the actual ride quality, it's not bad. It's actually got the rough road conditions covered and it gives you that typical Toyota nothing can break me feel about it. It's very solid, very dependable. But let's keep things in context here and that's where price comes into it. At just under 300k for the manual and 313,000 Rand for the auto, these criticisms I think can be largely overlooked. So the Russia's biggest negatives, its old school engine and drivetrain and drive refinement, are actually things that consumers shopping in this segment place less importance on. The boxes they want, the Rush triple ticks. Looks, specification, and most importantly, price. And it certainly helps that the box it comes in has this badge on it. Coming up after the break, we're going to round up the week's automotive newsmakers, which include the facelifted Mercedes-Benz C-Class. The cabin is where you'll find most of the changes. A whole suite of driver assistance packages are now available, which Mercedes-Benz claim is on par with the range-topping S-Class limo. And we'll also sample every single M5, from the very first E28 to the latest F90. What a story. A few months ago we drove the Lamborghini Urus on the international launch in Rome and now this awe-inspiring super SUV is available in South Africa. Unveiled at the company's Century City showroom in Cape Town, this angular mud plugger is every bit as dramatic in the metal as it appears on screen. You can take our word for it. Marius covered all the mind-bending facts and figures in the feature, but in case you missed it, you can watch it on our YouTube channel. Annually, Lamborghini sell around 30 units in South Africa, but they hope to double that with the new Urus, and if the reaction of the motoring media is anything to go by, they are likely to succeed. Staying with SUVs, last month also saw the local debut of Volkswagen's third-generation Touareg. 
The company claims it is the most technologically advanced model in its current lineup, and the list of safety features alone reads like a Gupta charge sheet. One of the most noticeable features, however, is the so-called InnoVision cockpit, which sports an integrated central infotainment screen and digital instrument cluster, similar to the layout found in some Mercedes-Benz models. There's only one engine option for now, a 3-litre TDI, with prices starting at 200 rand short of a million bucks. That price tag is bound to get the tongues wagging, but without a doubt the biggest talking point will be the styling, which is much bolder than before and sports a couple of interesting new cues, like the rear haunches that were seemingly inspired by Audi's Quattro blisters. Keep an eye out for our full review of the Touareg in an upcoming episode of Ignition GT. Now for something a little less in your face, Mercedes-Benz have become known for the subtlety of their model updates, and the newly refreshed C-Class is no exception. With over 400,000 units sold in 2017 alone, the German company is onto a winning recipe. Nevertheless, the designers and engineers have made in excess of 6,500 changes to this bread and butter model. Very few of those revisions can be seen. In fact, visual updates were confined to redesigned head and tail light clusters and a fresh look for the front bumper. The cabin is where you'll find most of the changes. A whole suite of driver assistance packages are now available, which Mercedes-Benz claim is on par with the range-topping S-Class limo. The steering wheel has also been nabbed from the S-Class and now affords you the option to control the optional 12.3-inch instrument cluster from the helm. As for the engines, a new 1.5-litre turbocharged petrol engine, mated to a 9-speed automatic transmission, is offered on the C200, while the C300 is powered by a new generation force-fed 2-litre petrol, which produces peak output of 190 kilowatts and 370 newton meters. Pricing starts at 586,000 Rand for the C180 sedan, 666 for the coupe version, and 793,500 for the C200 Cabriolet. The C43 comes in at 100,000 over the million Rand mark. And finally this week, Ignition GT also attended the launch of the facelifted Ford EcoSport. With new spec, tech and safety, we're pleased to see Ford has managed to keep the entry price respectable at just over 260,000 Rand, with the top spec titanium auto coming in at 340. For that, you get sat-nav as standard on an 8-inch touchscreen, cruise control, seat warmers, oh, and puddle lamps. Importantly, both this top spec and the trend below it will come to South Africa from Europe and feature the award-winning 1-litre EcoBoost engine. It's peppy and fun and only struggles slightly on the bigger hills. Our singular quibble with the drive was the very apparent wind noise. The only diesel in the range is the bottom spec Ambiente, and that will continue to be built in India. In line with an increasing demand for autos, the European built models will come with a new six-speed shifter, or you can still opt for a manual. Introduced in 2013, the EcoSport is an important model for Ford and was one of the pioneers in the ever-expanding mini SUV segment. We're pleased to report that with the new upgrades, including seven airbags now standard on the one-meter models, the revised EcoSport has become even more appetizing. So best you stay tuned, because after the break, we're going to focus on the history of one of the world's most revered super saloons. It's a giveaway, isn't it? The car that left me trembling was that <laughs> F10. It's just so oh, yeah. wild wow. and raucous and a bit of a handful. Standing in the presence of all six BMW M5 installments offers an illuminating view into the evolution of the breed. And South Africa is uniquely woven into the chronicles of the iconic performance line. One could unofficially say that the M5 story began right here. In 1976, the 530 Motorsport Limited Edition, MLE, based on the E12 designation of the 5 Series, was birthed on local shores. Only 218 units were produced, homologating the model for competitive pursuits on track. The 530 MLE preceded the M535i of 1979, as well as the M1 of 1978, which is of course documented in the annals of history as the first bona fide M-badged offering from BMW.
But the true genesis of the sporting saloon species, as stated by BMW, came in the form of the E28 M5. The shark-nosed four-door was released in 1985, employing a derivative of the six-cylinder engine that featured in the M1 Coupe. The practical family chariot literally had the heart of a supercar. E28, um, obviously the first of the M5s, hand-built, um, and yeah, special, special car. It was the first of the cars to have a supercar motor, so that sort of wowed the world, and it was this luxury car that you could put your family in, but you know, storm down the autobahn at a hell of a pace. Then came the turn of the E34 in 1989. While the version adopted a more executive overture to its constitution, it remained faithful to the motorsport heritage with a mechanical cestet under the hood that still shared bits with the M1. I love the E34, last of the hand-built M5s. Um, it's just got that real sleeper look to it, a like complete sleeper. The other ones you can kind of see the pace, but I think for me my favorite is the E39. The way it looks, the way it sounds, just everything. With the looming millennium, BMW sought to thrust into proceedings with a mightier M5 that trounced its two forebears in the technical statistics department. The E39 featured an eight-cylinder unit under the hood. Remember that classic commercial with the jet-propelled vehicle captioning the M5 as the fastest saloon on the planet? Not only did this M5 up the ante in terms of pace and potency, it boasted technology befitting the captains of industry who signed on the dotted line. Buyers were able to specify items that featured in the 7 series of that era, including a telephone, a television, navigation, and an interface that could be considered a precursor to the contemporary BMW iDrive digital setup. E39, you know, it's uh, that 4.9 naturally aspirated V8, the six-speed manual. Mm. Um, driving around here, I left the traction control on because I don't really know what it's going to do with it off. <laughs> of um, and, like, and that's the thing, it, it, it was one of those cars that, that introduced that kind of system. Mm. And it's literally an on or off, that's it. And it's so cool to see because it sits in the middle of all these cars of that old school meets new school. In 2005, the recipe was rewritten with the Chris Bangle penned E65 series. Its screaming 10-cylinder power source and 7-speed sequential automated manual gearbox nodded to the knowledge gleaned from those BMW Sauber F1 activities. Whatever your impressions, one must concede that for this reason, the E60 M5 is destined for future classic status. We are not likely to see such a configuration from the Mark again. The model featured here is even more special as it is one of a handful of touring variants brought to South Africa. How often do you get a screaming road car that often sounds like a Formula 1 car? Um, and I also just think it's so cool having like a mommy wagon <laughs> that will clean up <laughs> like yeah next came the 2011 f10 m5 reverting to a v8 mil albeit with the aid of forced induction it was the first turbocharged m5 the abiding memory was one of its heft and slipperiness this was a brutal piece of kit whose steering squirmed and writhed in the hand like a rabid pet seal its backside was only too eager to shimmy Although this M5 piped acoustics into the cabin, its oral presence was decidedly average. It lacked the distinction of those notable predecessors under full chat, though it lacked little when it came to power. A competition package was released for the F10, offering a bump in engine outputs and additional poise courtesy of suspension revisions. Our market also received an exclusive special pure metal edition version of which just 20 were made, commemorating 30 years of the moniker. Speaking to some of the more seasoned commentators in the industry, it seems that the F10 is not regarded as the zenith of the M5 collection. Bear in mind, of course, that nostalgia and subjectivity does invariably creep into such verdicts. The car that left me trembling was that <laughs> F10. It's just so wild wow. and raucous and a bit of a handful. So, what will the latest 2018 F90 M5 be remembered for? 
Well, for starters, this is the first M5 to feature all-wheel drive. And before you spit on the floor and dismiss it as a sellout, remember that the rival Mercedes-AMG product went the same route. The move was inevitable. No sense in having an abundance of power at your disposal if all it does is overwhelm the rear wheels. Although the new M5 is replete with a rear wheel drive only mode that lets its driver loose sans electronic aids. Try that one at your own risk. If we regard the traditional M5 character as cosseting, easy to drive daily, practical and seriously rapid, then this iteration delivers amply. All wheel drive makes the new M5 more forgiving, noted in instances where corners are tackled with a leaden foot. It connects straights to turns with fierce emergency. Unlike its predecessor, which used the 7-speed dual-clutch transmission, the new M5 adopts an 8-speed automatic. It has the same displacement and number of cylinders as the former car, but with more power of course at 441 kilowatts and 750 newton meters. Good for a sprint time of 3.4 seconds, says the manufacturer. Perhaps the G30 may go down in history as being the last BMW M5 to employ internal combustion entirely. We know that hybrid technology will be incorporated into the future M models, and we might just be witnessing peak M5 before the breed succumbs to the perceived benefits of the alternative propulsion era. The latest BMW M5 is of course superior in all quantifiable aspects, but um, what do you think the best M5 is? Well, obvious question. <laughs> well, yeah, the E39 because it's mine. Um, but yeah, I mean, I agree with what you said. Uh, I, I saw you drive this new one around. <laughs> And although it is so fast, it was very controlled. But when you got into that F10, it was like you just became a hooligan of notes. Um, and I think that's what's cool with the M5 is no matter which one you look at, it inspires all sorts of different emotions from a petrol head. Mm. So one vote for E39, E39. Oliver? Uh, definitely, yes, I love a screaming V10. Um, but I love the, the F10, where if you if you disrespect it, it'll, it'll bite back hard. This new one, the looks for me are amazing. The old one, it's just the granddaddy of them all. But I think I have to go with Justin, eh? the E39. Oh, bro. It's just, <laughs> it's just, the way it looks, the way it sounds, everything just does it for me. Like we said, they're all so different in so many ways. And I think, you know, what's also aided that is the fact that the engine changes each time. Um, the, whereas the new one kind of has the F10's engine. But I think the all-wheel drive system makes the new one a lot more controllable. Mm. But mm. for me, I think there's no better stamp of approval than having bought, you know, to go and buy one. And for me, E60, okay. screaming V10 in a road car, it's, it's the most exotic of the M5s for me. And yeah, I think it's just so special, especially in a station wagon. Yeah. So, it's my vote. Look, I mean, in every quantifiable sense, the new one is superior. But, you know, of course, nostalgia creeps into these things and for me, E39, it was a car I drove in need for speed, high stakes, <laughs> you know? But one thing we, we can all agree on is that uh, there's good reason as to why that M5 nameplate is so well regarded. When we get behind the wheel of Bentley's Bentayga, awe-inspiring it may be, but it's not beautiful. We also bring you the latest automotive news from around the world, including a sneak peek at the very first Mercedes-Benz A-Class sedan. And Lindsay chats to Neil Hill, who heads up the Blue Oval's local operations. But until next time, you guys know what to do. Keep it safe on the road so we can see you next week. Uh...